Well, welcome back to another edition of the DHF podcast. My name is Rick Grace. I have the privilege of serving at DHF as their church liaison, position I've been in for about four years now. So let me introduce to begin with our co-host, uh, Drew McClellan. Drew, welcome and uh, tell the folks a little bit about yourself. Well, hello, Rick. It's good to be back on. I really enjoy doing these things. I am a, a DHF board member and I am the lead pastor at First Christian Church in Port Arthur, Texas. And we are really pleased to have with us today a couple that we are going to call Linda and Ray. And they have such a unique story that we wanted to get this story out um, just because of, 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 of its impact and, and the, the ministry that these two have together. Let me welcome um, Linda and Ray to the podcast. Welcome, guys. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. It's a privilege and glad to be here. It is. It's great to have you with us. And maybe as a as a unique way of starting the story, um, Ray, you've got an interesting story in how you came to Christ. How about can you share a little bit of that background, a little bit of that story with us? Of course. Uh, yeah, uh, like you guys um, say, it's. Um, let's say I grew up in a different area of the planet on the other side of the world and it's a, a Muslim world and I grew up in a Muslim family and the uh, country of well let's say Central Asia I grew up in a Muslim family and since a little boy I dreamed to be to want to be a Muslim mullah so alongside I practice and my grandma was strong Muslim and everything I knew it's all my family, relatives, and that, and they are Muslims. So um, we didn't know anything else, but same time, we knew, and we grew up in the Soviet Union country, Soviet Union, you guys know what Soviet Union is. So um, we, we had a, two cultures, Russian and our Uzbek culture. So, um, and at same time, I practiced boxing because my dad decided that Maybe it's not good for me to go into mosque all the time, five times a day. So he decided maybe I can do something else. And so he took me some local places and I ended up choosing a boxing gym. So I thought it was cool. And this nine years old, I started doing boxing too. Same time, I would go to mosque on Fridays and uh, go to the gym on other days and the school, of course. Uh, but uh, And that kind of changed my uh, life a little bit. So 17 years old, I became a champion in my country and um, decided to join the mafia group because I'm a best boxer in the country and do some not a really good things and ended up getting caught. And some of the, uh, my friends, they uh, told the police that I was their leader and they got arrested and uh, they gave me two years of probation. And I thought, wow, that wasn't really smart and let's, uh, Think about that. So um, I decided to go to law school so I can learn about law and how we can get away with those things. So that was, <laughs> that's how, uh, that's how we thought. So, you know, and it's, uh, there is no, how do you say? That was a, I thought that was a good thing to do. And while I was in the university, we heard that this American student is coming to my university. And I thought, wow, cool. They have some good stuff. Let's go and uh, rob them, beat them up and take their stuff. So um, so we showed up at the English club and that they have summertime. And we kicked the door open, came in and kind of tried to do a little hustling job. But they thought, oh, welcome. Come on in. You guys can come down and sit. And we are learning English today. We're like, what is this people? <laughs> and so they didn't give us any chance. They didn't give us any chance to fight. They're like being civil and being like nice to us. And it's like we kind of try to make a noise in the back seat, try to, you know, like throw an F bomb there and there. And they're like, oh, no, this is, I don't know. It was just different. So in the end, they said, oh, we can, we see some athletes on the back row. Hey, guys, uh, we would like to, guys, if you stay, we'll teach you how to play American football. We're like, wow, that's a great opportunity. Let's go take them behind the 
building went to a, a soccer field and beat them up beat them up there that'd be more <laughs> hiding so we took him back to the soccer field or whatever and uh, started learning about this american football thing and i actually i completely forgot about my mission what we supposed to do we came back next day and next day and next day started learning english and uh, we became good friends over the summers and um uh, we become kind of guides for them. So um, I don't know. It's uh, something, and I noticed that I knew it, something different about these guys, right? So they would, they don't cuss, but same time, they're good athletes, and but just genuinely nice people. And I was like, well, something not right. They don't look like a Hollywood movies, but they're Americans, right? They're supposed to be doing all those things. And one day I saw the the woman and the one girl and a the guy, they were arguing between each other. And I was like, hmm, just listening to the argument. And then finally the, the guy says, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done this. I was like, why are you asking forgiveness from woman? You know where you are? You're in a Muslim country. You don't ask for forgiveness from woman. And uh, so, but he said, uh, I, uh, I respect her and She's the same kind of person I am, and I need to ask forgiveness. I was like, wow, that is different. What if my culture did that? It would be different. My mom will have a better life. My sister will have probably going to have a better life because at least they respect women, you know? So that's kind of changed me a little bit. And later on, they invited me to their apartment and where they were staying, and we watched this film called Jesus Film. And I knew about Jesus. His name is Esau. And in Quran. So, and after the movie end, I remember I said, why they killed him? So, and the guys, they started talking to me and explaining to me that, uh, that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. And uh, so they shared with me, the, they call it a little booklet for spiritual law, just the, the man is sinful and, you know, in the, in the Muslim world, you have to do sacrifice every year and you can do every month and do the, all the things. And maybe you have enough good deeds so you'd be forgiven. So there is no hope. And when I heard that concept, what he telling me, I was like, wow, that makes sense, actually. If one person, and he is God, who dies for your sins, and if you can be forgiven because of him, and he's perfect. And Jesus is perfect in the Quran. He never sinned. He was born without a father, earthly father, and I was like, wow, that thing I'd never heard before. So, and I said, okay, let me try. I, and he said, well, you can ask him, try him, to, he can prove to you that he is real God. I said, okay. And I prayed and I said, Lord Jesus, if you are real, change my life. And I'm going to trust you that you're real and show me that you're real God. And I prayed that day and became a believer. So that's kind of started everything off and later on i decided to tell my parents that i'm christian that did not went well for me and of course uh i i mean long story short uh my family tried to kill me and i was on my knees and praying and asking them okay and i can see my dad stay next to me with his axe in his hand and i just closed my eyes and i stopped to pray to jesus like lord i know I have seen you. I remember what did you say that please forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And forgive my family. They don't know you. Please, uh, I'm ready to be with you, but promise me that you're going to send an angel or you're going to do something that they know that you're real God. And I was praying in my own language in Uzbek. And uh, so they said, you're not my son anymore. They, they kicked me out of the house. They didn't kill me, but they kicked me out of the house. And I lived in the streets for like three months, I think. And I heard that it was a Bible college in a different country, neighboring country, where um, they uh, they gave me a scholarship. And I went to Bible college and graduated. And after that, joined with the Campus Crusade for Christ and became a missionary for the last 23 years now. I've been working with them. So that's long story. No, well, what a what a story. So, but how how long was it from the time you first heard 
uh, mm-hmm. started to befriend these Americans. How long a process was that before uh, you went, if I, if I can use the word, you, you went from Islam to Isa. How long did that take? Uh, um, actually, um, it was 1998. Um, I became a believer in August. Right. So, and after they left, I didn't know any. They, they all left. They went back, back to fly to America. And I was like all by myself. I was like, now what? Actually, I did live same kind of life I did before, but this time was something different. And that's when I uh, started to notice that. And I okay. There's a one small story. Um, it was a, somebody at the school. He's trying to bully. Well, and he didn't know I'm a former boxer. So he's like, hey, I want to fight you. I was like, no, you don't want to fight me. Just go along. <laughs> and he kind of passed at me and like, okay, let's go back to the building. And he tried to throw a punch, of course, and he was unsuccessful. And he was laying on the ground. <laughs> and um, he's all like sideways laying on the ground. And I hear the voice like, Rafshan, do you remember? You invited me, you became a Christian. You can't do this anymore. I looked around, it's like, who's talking to me? I can hear it, him talking about you. So I picked the guy up and wiped his pants, gave us his wallet back, and looked at me, he'd run away. He said, you're crazy. I went home that night and I said, who are you? Who are you talking to me? Why I cannot enjoy my old life anymore? So he reminded me again, you are Christian now. And from now on, I start to notice that something changed inside, something changed. My heart completely changed, and I couldn't do what I did before. And later on, about a week later, somebody called me. Um, They invited me to a Bible study group. I guess it was a small Bible study group in my city. And I started to go to Bible study and start learning. First time I had a Bible, they gave me a Bible in my own language. Uh, No, it wasn't Russian language. So I started studying and learning and started to grow in my faith. So about it took about, I don't know, about six months, I think, to fully, and from the moment that I became a believer, to start to go into the Bible study and know that I am a believer about six months. And but how many I believers? Knew that first night when I prayed, I knew that I was honest and I was completely 100% asking him, if you real, change my life. And mm-hmm. I remember that was a pure talk to him. That I, and so. Wow. At, at that time, how many, how many believers would you guess there were in your, in your whole country? Uh, I, I don't know any, I, I didn't know any other Uzbek believers in my country that I was a believer. I was a okay. Later on, they told me I was like one of four believers. There was a couple other uh, older couple, uh, maybe I don't remember, but it wasn't many. So it was few. It's been twenty, about uh, twenty five years ago. Now we have more, but then it was I was one of the few believers. In his city, there was four hundred thousand people, and he was the only college student from mm-hmm. his race that we knew had become a Christian mm-hmm. from his culture. Wow. So has your family converted? Are they still uh, in Islam? or? Yes, uh, most of them, 99.9% of them still Islam, and they believe that. My mom, uh, while I was in a Bible college, I left. You remember I had a Bible. I left the Bible at home, and uh, it was Injil. It's an Uzbek language, and I left that at home. And when I came to visit them at during the actually Christmas time, the Bible college, they release people at Christmas time. So I went home and well, kind of visit them. I tried to visit and show them that I am same kind of person. I just I am their son, but you know, I have different values now. So they they allowed me to come to visit them and uh, one of the evenings my mom said, Can I talk to you? So I said, Okay. So we went to a different room. And my mom said, what is this? She's showing me the Injil, the Bible. And she's like, I said, well, looks like you find my book. She said, yes. And she opens the book of John. And she says, I stopped, I wanted to learn what do you believe. 
and I stopped the reading book of John, and I said, she said, this guy, she's pointing at one of the verses, he told me that I need to open my heart and receive him, and he will change my life. I was like, what do you mean? Yeah, and I received him, and he came, and he changed me. And I went outside. We had a um, neighbor who's a thief, and everybody hated the guy because he steals stuff from everybody and get away with. So my mom said, I saw him. I couldn't hate him anymore. I stopped praying for him. I was like, Mom, what did you do? <laughs> so she became a believer. She's reading the book of John. She became a believer, but she asked me to not tell anyone because she'll be stoned if I told them. So I uh, keep it secret. And so, yeah, I, I know she did become a believer and she her life has changed, but she would go to the uh, like a ladies by Quran studies and throw some questions there and there. It's like she said one day I went there and uh, she was talking about Muhammad and all that. And I said, what about this guy Esau in the Quran? Can we talk about him? Why well, he looks like a, he's a great guy. He never sinned and he's going to come back to judge the world. And ladies didn't like that. They, they kick her out of the Bible <laughs> Quran study. <laughs> <laughs> So, What's yeah, and uh, yeah, that's how she became a believer. She is a believer, but um, really hard for her to grow because she are by herself. Sure. And about uh, nine months ago, she had a, a stroke. So right now she can't really talk. Her right side is uh, um, paralyzed. paralyzed. So, But when we visited about a couple of months ago to see her and uh, kind of several times, uh, so me and Lisa usually we pray before the meal, like we do all the time. And I knew she stopped reaching out. She hold my hand, and she wanted to let them know that she's going to pray with us before meal. That mm. was um, – so I knew that she's now not holding it back. Even she cannot speak, but she's showing the rest of the family that she wants to – she's praying with us before the meal, letting them know that she's a believer. Oh, praise God. Well, let's let's bring your better half in uh, to the conversation. How did you two even meet? I mean, you got so so you're a boxer in Central Asia, and your mm -hmm. wife's a basketball player in the U.S. <laughs> How did you guys even get together? Well, uh, I don't know how long of a story you want. Um, I was coaching. <laughs> I was coaching basketball at uh, Montana State uh, in Division One, and a, a gal came into my my office and shared with me, and I came to the Lord. And about a year and a half, two years later, I felt God calling me from out of basketball and into full time ministry. And so I was there in His country. Uh, I actually set up the Bible study, the English club that He went to, but I left for the summer. Our whole team left, and the summer project came. And um, so when they came back, we heard that they said, oh, we had this guy, that, a couple of these guys came to Christ. And we're like, cool, where's their contacts? We're like, we don't have them. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, so we prayed that we could find them. We found out later another guy on our team actually had the contacts. And then he contacted them. And, um, yeah, Ray came to our, he met with our director, and then the director sent him to the Bible study that was happening at my house. Yeah, I wanted to go to the director's house because he's a male, right? And he's like, oh, we have enough guys here. You guys going to be me and some other guys. You're going to be in this house doing the Bible study with this group. And I was like, I don't want to go to somebody else's house. So, um, But I ended up going to that house, and I actually came in, and I saw him in uh, Linda. <laughs> and I was like, hey, Linda, do you remember me? We danced last year. She's like, I don't remember you. <laughs> so actually, I met her, I met her year before. Uh, I wasn't a believer yet. She, I guess she was coaching basketball to our girls in my university, and the girls invited her to the dance that I was organizing, put it together, for the first year students. And I, you know, I was a mafia guy still at the school. And I, I saw this American girl showed up at the dance without a ticket, without an invitation, like what she's doing here. So, and I actually slow dance came on. I saw she's kind of hiding, try to run away. 
I kind of blocked her away and asked her to dance with me. And she couldn't say no. And she danced with me and I asked her, what are you doing here? She said, oh, I'm a basketball coach. Well, that was it. And we danced and she went somewhere and I continued doing the dance and all that. And a year later, after all that thing I told you guys happened, I went to that Bible study group and I saw her again and I said, hey, Linda, do you remember me? And she's like, no, I don't remember you. <laughs> well, that's how we met again. So this yeah. was not a case of love at first sight. <laughs> <laughs> not really. <laughs> I saw at the dance, I saw him come in and I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm not out of here. And he goes, no, you need to dance with him. I'm like, what? <laughs> so I'm like, well, I'm not to share Christ with him. So I dance and he asked, what are you doing here? And the Lord said, no. And so I'm like, I'm a basketball coach. <laughs> so, yeah, so that was our first meeting. Then after he um, came to, we just started at the Bible study, he began to remind me, don't you, you remember or this? And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, I remember. She played tough. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know. When he said, do you remember me? I was like, well, so do I say, um, I do, but remind me where we met. <laughs> Or do I just say no? And so I just said, no, I don't remember you. <laughs> Mark. So but now I do. Curious question. Did, did you learn his language or was he speaking English? No. How did, you, was, how did you communicate? Uh, in Russian. I had been in Russia for five years before that. Okay. And so, so I knew Russian fluently. Yeah, she speaks pretty good uh, English and Russian. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, um, Russian is my third language. So, I, I mean, our first year, five year of our marriage, we spoke Russian only. And I started learning English, so now I can uh, speak a little bit of English. Yeah, I used to translate his whole story, so I can, so I, I can correct him pretty easily. <laughs> so how yeah. long? Okay, so now you're, you, you've at least acknowledge maybe you remember him maybe um <laughs> yeah we each other a little did, bit yeah uh, how, how, did you start dating thereafter or who i'm who was the pursuer uh the holy spirit <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good answer <laughs> i knew i liked i mean i liked her but it's a long story short i mean um i while i was uh persecuted and um same time and you have to understand in the Uz Uzbek culture, you live with your parents till you're married and have two or three kids. And only after that, if your parents let you go, you can move out to have a different place. But because it's the you take you care for your parents. And when I got kicked out, when they disowned me, I kind of became more free. And I knew in Christ I was free. So, uh, but I liked Lisa before that. So, and during that time, I asked her to date me. I asked her to, to I mean. Well, in his culture, there's on. no dating either. No so, dating, the, it's arranged marriages. Okay. So, the mom usually arranges it. So, I kind of blew that schedule all, <laughs> all up. So, I mean, we, uh, we uh, stopped the dating. And I, uh, I mean, I was living in somewhere else. I wasn't living at home. So, I told my parents that, hey, that's okay, you guys kick me out, and I'm not your son, but just want to let you know that I'm dating American girl, too. And they're like, oh, maybe it's okay, you believe her, but American girl has to go. <laughs> <laughs> so that was even worse, huh? <laughs> that was even worse. Worse than that, I am. <laughs> but I didn't listen to them, and I told them that's, well, that's what's going to happen, and we got engaged, and I went to Bible college. So... Um, and after after I graduated from college, then we got married. So, but we date for about a year and a half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot more to the story um, <laughs> from the other side, but yeah. So I felt like he might have. He was uh, working in a community ministry with some of my roommates who are also nationals, and so he would come to my house and pick up the girls, drive my car out to the village, and then come back in and pick me up and then i would drive him to his house and sometimes we would go in and meet his family so we knew his, i knew his family already and then um 
there was a point when he said he liked somebody. And our, all, of course, as girls, we're trying to figure out who it is. And there was a certain phrase that I was like, I would never say that. So I don't think it's me. But then I felt like maybe he did have feelings. So I tried to distance myself. And then there was a point where God <clears throat> kind of shut him down and said, you know, distance yourself from her. So during that time, I began to see his character like a man of faith, a man of God, um, the way he handled the ministry that we were doing was out and it opened my eyes. And um, mm. I was like, oh boy, I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Finally. <laughs> Well, you've and, you've uh, mentioned yeah. it. You, you've mentioned it a couple times. So let's segue in. Tell us about your ministry now. And I, I know you have to be careful in what you can and can't say. But go ahead and describe for us what you can about the ministry God has called you you to as literally as a couple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we uh, we did work in uh, um, Central Asian country for last last 22 years uh, we did a sport ministry we work because I'm a former boxer she's a coach and we did uh, reach use athletic uh, athletics and coaching and teaching kids or training and working with the teams and Olympics and stuff like that we use that avenue to reach people and um, our son is going to school um, he's uh, he goes to Illinois State, and we were kind of transitioning, and we kind of handed over the ministry that we had, our local uh, staff and local guys, local pastor, local staff, and the ministry grew, and it's like, it's a time to hand it over to the next generation, because they, they're they going to do better. They're younger, and they're, uh, well, it's our disciples, and it's like, wow, that's cool. Now, God, what do you want for us now? So, and we joined this ministry called Jesus Film Project. And it's uh, kind of expanded our area of uh, only 18 million to uh, the whole, we call it 1040 window. It's uh, North Africa, Middle East, and Central Asia. So that's going to be my role uh, to reaching that area, predominantly Muslim background, Muslim believers. I mean, <laughs> they're Muslims. And because... I am came from that culture. I think I have a little bit of understanding the culture and the language, and I and God's like, well, I want you to, I want you to help with this part that how we can reach that region. So, yeah, for me, I think it was well as we transitioned to the United States, we wanted to to find a ministry where we can continue to use our language, our culture and resource the area we were at. Because being there, we know the vast amount of resources that's available here in the United States. Mm -hmm. But a pastor there does not have a wall of books. He has maybe three. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was like, how can we bring what we can know here? And I was standing in a park in his country and I looked around and I'm like, there's nobody here that's a believer. And I doubt that there's anybody here who even knows a believer. And it was just like, a tidal wave of this scope of what needs to be done is so much bigger than us, you know, than just working one at a time. So I saw that um, with what we're doing now, it's a way to accelerate the spread of the gospel in such a way as that we're not working one-on-one -on -one with people. I mean, we do, we do that too, but we're working with the church planners and pastors. Like Rafshan said, a lot of those were our disciples before. Um, Ray said that actually, <laughs> my friend Ray, and uh, Rob Song is another guy. Um, so, but by using that, we're able to um, resource the church planners and bring them the resources that help them to be able to plant new churches and new groups and things like that. And so the Jesus film does that. It's not just the Jesus film. Mm -hmm. It's a strategy that's through that where they use a Jesus film. It's been divided into segments. And um, so basically, Jesus teaches the Bible study. Mm -hmm. It was first developed in Central America, and then it was so uh, fruitful that they brought it back to the headquarters, developed it into a strategy that's now literally all over the world. I mean, um, everywhere, <laughs> in Africa, all sorts of different places. Yeah. And the Ray's team works in this area yeah, I, that we're yeah. In. it's interesting that um i can explain with my own cultural understanding that 
maybe people will get understanding more that what I see here in America, you have a senior pastor, you have pastor, you have youth pastors, you have libraries, you have books, and you have 250 years of history of how the church is developed and how they all different strategies and different, th different things like that. Can you imagine uh, all that in the areas, Middle East, North Africa, and Central Asia, that doesn't exist? I am the first generation believer. I am the one of the oldest guy, and I'm not that old yet, but uh, oldest guy who knows Jesus. And the rest of the young generation, they, I didn't have a father who believed in God, who taught me some things. I didn't have a pastor who lead our church the way that Jesus will do. I didn't have libraries. I didn't have anything like that. So we are, I am the first generation, and I was looking at this Jesus Film Projects like we need to start to develop and helping our young pastors and church planters and young leaders give them resources and train them and, and help them to do what is happening in Christian countries, how they can reach, because they know the language, they know the culture, only they don't have resources and materials so they can translate and they can reach their own people the way God is teaching them to do, like he did it through me. So I think that's one of the main important things is we're going to pour into our local pastors, leaders, church planters, so they have the, all the necessary tools and training that they can continue and grow and live in those cultures and reaching their own neighborhoods. And can you imagine another 15, I don't know, 20, 15 years, they have churches every street, or they have pastors, they have older guys who can teach younger generation, they have strategies, they have libraries, they have materials and project everything they need to continue the gospel. Look at this. I understand this is a, not a two-year fixing thing or five-year thing. It's a generational. Mm -hmm. And we don't know when Jesus come back, but we want to put those things in place now so in the future they have biblical culture that continues on and reaching the generations. One of the things that happens is Areas too is that it's there, they may not read that well, mm -hmm. illiterate. So, the Jesus film specifically, Paul Eshelman, who developed it, um, the Jesus film has been translated into 2,400 languages. And Wycliffe and other translators now translate the book of Luke first so that it can be put to the Jesus film because it's Jesus, it's the book of Luke, and he speaks directly from the Gospel of Luke. So, as they see it, see the film, they're seeing Jesus teaching, they're seeing his life, mm. which is hard to describe, you know, it's harder to read it, especially if you can't read. Sure. And so a lot of the strategies and things that we use, and like the Jesus Film app has 200 um, full length movies and short films and question answering, answering things in 2400 languages that fits in your pocket. And so they can use this as a resource. And so that's one of the things that we've seen, like, in, in the area where we work, the average is one church for every 300,000 people. And wow. our goal is to bring that to one church for every 1,000 people. In fact, one of the teams, a, a national team that we know, has taken on 20 million people, and the goal is to plant 20,000 churches. How are they going to do that? Well, again. they have different <laughs> tools, and one of the tools will be... Jesus film, so they can use that too. Mm -hmm. It's just, yeah, we call it just another tool, the evangelical tool. So we hope to use that tool. It took us a while to understand fully what the Jesus, and we still don't, what the Jesus project, what it covers. Um, but we went with them in the spring uh, overseas, and the group that we were working with, they said, we want to use this, before we came, they said, we want to use this strategy to see if we can really start a church from that. And so we didn't know that. And so we taught the strategy, and by October, they had launched their first church. So that was May to October. And now they want to go into either even deeper areas and continue to Completely be Completely areas where no access at all. So that new church is 12 people, mom, mom and a son, they got baptized, and they have another 10 people start the new church just a couple of months ago. 
you said uh, I, I got one for each of you, I guess, because uh, Ray, you said something earlier that just it was very affirming to me. Uh, when somebody asked me where to start in Scripture, I always say John, always mm -hmm. say John. And to hear you say that it was the Gospel of John that that the Holy Spirit used to speak is is very affirming to to what I was saying. Uh, but Linda, I think you said something here, and and I hope everybody who's listening caught what you said. Uh, we're very sheltered in the United States, very sheltered in the United States. Um, to to think that you could stand in a park like you said you did, and to look around and say, not only is no one around me a believer but no one knows a believer. No one has the opportunity to even believe shows us how much work we really still have to do. And we don't think that way in the United States. You know, there's a, a church on every corner in a lot of areas and it's, it becomes, uh, it becomes almost second nature uh, in those thoughts. So I guess my question, Linda, for you would be, you have two strikes against you. You're a, mm -hmm. a woman and you're an American. So how does that work? How does that work for you when you're when you're in those areas and in, in those predominantly Islamic areas? Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things is I understand the language and I understand the culture. That definitely helps, um, so I can relate to them, you know, one on one. Um, I'm a woman, and I, I kind of understand how they relate to. So it's I'm you know in my mind I know that even though I ministered there for 20 years, a girl that's 20, a woman that's 20 years old is going to, from that culture, from that language is going to be so much more effective than I could ever begin to. So what I'm, my idea is that it's not me that's doing it. Obviously it's the Holy spirit and it's helping a vessel <laughs> that's going to be even more effective than me. So it's a lot of discipleship. Like I'm, you know, like the gals write me now and like, what should I do about this? Or what should I do about that? And so that's how the discipleship continues on. Um, I think it's funny that, that in every model we see, mm -hmm. the models that work mm -hmm. are Paul's model. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it, 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 everything comes to, to, to New Testament, you know, making disciples, allowing the disciples to move on by themselves. Uh, and, and we failed here, I think, in, in that nature. But to see that the, the the answer is right in front of you. It's in the word. It was given to us, uh, and uh, to see Paul's model being the successful model is is just uh, just amazing at what the Holy Spirit is can do and will do if we just obey where He's leading us to go. So yeah, what you're <laughs> suggesting then, Drew, is the more biblical we become, the more effective we might be. I mean that's a, that's a hard <laughs> that's a hard concept, but yeah. <laughs> Hey, um, I think, Drew, you're just heading the, like, my heart issue here. You just headed on it. It's like, why are we spending so much time and energy to make our church bigger and, but same time, the missions budget or the missionaries they have, it's really, really small. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what Jesus said 20,000 years ago when he was, one of his last words, go make disciples of all nations. And where does that happen? What happened with that? Why are we not doing that more? Like one of the statistics that we have, we usually talk to people about, that, that we call the world A, the R area, 1040 window, where the 95% of them are Muslims and uh, unreached people groups. That's the only area left, unreached people groups. And it's 29% of the world, that 1040 window. And only 1% of the finances go to that world, and only 3% of the missionaries go to that world. From the whole total of the whole world missionaries, only 3%. And the whole finances, everything, only 1%. I was shocked that to hear that. It's like, wow, when are we going to start to have um, awakening in the churches that, hey, yeah. maybe we need to pay a little more attention to how we reaching out to the world what Amen. Jesus told us. Amen. What's so interesting about what you just said was, so I'm I'm 35. I've been in church my entire life. My dad was a Baptist, is a Baptist minister. Uh, and uh, those, those missionaries, I didn't know anything about the, the 1040 window until three years ago, four years ago. Uh, General Baptist Missions has uh, a Bible college in the Philippines and they're working, you know, that way across. Uh, but before that, you know, it was always, 
Honduras or the Dominican or, you know, something uh, in, in, or Africa. Africa was always, you know, huge. On, and, and it was never there was never a thought in, in growing up that uh, that there was a whole group of people that that just aren't being reached. And uh, and then, of course, after, you know, 9-11, that that got even harder to, to, to convince people, hey, there's still a whole group of people that that need to be reached. Yeah. They're the ones that are going to kill you. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> Drew. I don't know about you. I, I I could see a phase two of this of this conversation happening Absolutely. with Absolutely. with our two guests this morning. Um, but but let me say this as, as we wrap it up because you guys mentioned how how few missionaries and how few resources go to the the ten forty mm-hmm. window and it's specifically the region you're going to be working at. Because of that area, we've had to be a little bit guarded in what we say. Um, mm-hmm. So if you would like to to hear more um, about Ray and Linda, if you would like to know more about their ministry and how you can partner with them, then we're going to ask you to do this. Get a hold of me. My name, again, is Rick Grace, um, and you can email me at rgrace at discipleheritage.org. Or go on to our website, which is simply discipleheritage.org, and you can find me on there and contact me, email me, and let me know that you want more information about how you can partner with these two and the work they're doing among, as as, as was mentioned, <laughs> the, the, the people groups that are are, are are being literally being ignored. Um mm-hmm are their target group. And if so if you, if you would like more information, then come to me, uh, email me at discipleheritage.org and then I will give you their contact information or pass, I'll pass your information on to them so that they can follow up. That would probably be the best way. So guys, thank you so much Absolutely. for being with us this morning. Um, what a blessing to hear how it's almost come full circle. How you were introduced to Jesus through the Jesus film, and now you are part of the Jesus film project. And you you guys mentioned something the other day that there's been over 600 million views of the Jesus film. Is that right? 11 billion views of Jesus film. It's the number one watched movie in the world. They have a record of Guinness. And 600 million people indicated decision to Christ after watching the movie. 600 million. Twice the size of the U.S. population, almost. (laughs) That's, I don't know that I can even get my mind around numbers that large. I just, I don't think in those cat 11 billion views with 600 million indicating the choice to follow Jesus. 10 million hits on YouTube. 10 million views on YouTube alone. So they have the gold button. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, YouTube is the record on the YouTube. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, again, guys, thank you for spending this part of your morning with us. And uh, don't, uh, yeah, let's do a round two. Um, and maybe you can help educate our audience more about this 1040 window and the opportunities and the difficulties of those of, of, mm-hmm. of being able to reach that area. Would you guys be game for that? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it would be great. And I'm, I mean, I'm always excited to talk about what God has been doing in the Muslim world, how he's reaching people. And I think people need to hear more of that, how Amen. God... Amen. I can do those things without you, Christians. But if you want a blessing, if you want to be part of it, please join me, because God is already doing it. People have dreams, people have... No Bibles, nothing, but they seeing Jesus in their dreams. And we, we have even situations like people come up to the office and say, hey, last night Jesus came to me after I watched the movie. He knocked on the door and I opened, he came to me and he told me that I need to show up here. It's like, what? <laughs> yeah, Jesus can't talk to me that I need to come talk to you guys. That's a real stories. Watching the film, Jesus coming to them, telling him, okay, Become a believer, go to this Christian, then they can follow up and disciple you. It's just uh, some, some of those stories. It's just uh, amazing. So God is working and spirit is moving through the Muslim world. There's a yeah. whole book. I just saw Jesus. It's about people who have seen the Jesus film. 
<laughs> this is like living in the book of Acts, guys. This exactly. is cool. <laughs> yeah. That's why we're excited. <laughs> oh, yeah. Amen. And, and we want to share in that excitement and get as many people to partner with you as we can. Absolutely. All right. Well, God right. bless you guys. And on behalf of DHF, thank you all for joining us this morning. If you've been blessed by this, leave us a good uh, uh, leave us good notes. And uh, if you want information about these two, again, contact me, Rick Grace at or rgrace at discipleheritage.org. Thank you and God bless. <laughs>